Earlier we talked about Newton's contribution in the discovery of gravity and its effects on masses. How apples fall towards the earth with an acceleration equal to g. The attraction of the apple is due to the gravitational force that is exerted by the planet pulling the apple towards it. This same force keeps the moon in orbit by attracting the moon towards the earth. This suggests that the moon is in free fall but does not crash to the earth since it is also moving sideways which keeps on missing the earth as it orbits around it. Gravitation is one of the fundamental forces in the universe that affects everything around us. It is the invisible force that pulls objects towards each other. Think of it as the reason why you stay firmly on the ground instead of floating away into space. The idea of gravity was first described by Sir Isaac Newton. He noticed that when you drop an apple from a tree, it falls to the ground. Newton wondered why this happened, and that's when he came up with his famous theory of gravitation. According to Newton's theory, every object in the universe with mass attracts other objects with mass. The bigger an object is, the stronger its gravitational pull. That's why the Earth's gravity keeps you and everything else stuck to its surface. It also influences our moon by keeping it in orbit around Earth. In this module we will look into this topic. This force of attraction can be stated in a general expression such that every particle or matter in the universe attracts every other particle with a force that is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the particles and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Let us recall Newton's third law, which states that whenever a body exerts a force on a second body, the second body exerts a force back on the first that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. As mass 2 exerts a force to mass 1 given by equation 1, we can imagine that mass 1 also exerts a force onto mass 2 given by equation 2. So we see that by third law of Newton the forces are equal but opposite in direction as shown in equation 3. In most systems, the interaction are not limited by two particles interacting with each other but it could be multiple particles as shown in the figure. The net force is the sum of the individual forces exerted by other forces on mass 1 for this particular case. We can apply component vector addition to calculate this value. Here we have an example of multiple masses. Three spheres are arranged as shown the figure. Find the magnitude and direction of the total gravitational force exerted on the small sphere mass m1 by both large ones mass m2 and mass m3. To solve for the problem we apply equation 4, where we sum the forces as it exerts on the mass of interest which is mass m1. But we have to apply component method and Pythagorean theorem to solve for the net force and its direction. From equation 4 we need to obtain the net forces along x and along y as shown by equation 5 and 6. We begin with the interaction between mass 1 and mass 2. We see that mass 2 with respect to mass 1 is aligned and with the Cartesian coordinate system we see here that it is along the x-axis. So we can simply set the y value of mass 2 as 0. Solving for the x component for mass 2 we use equation 9 and substitute the known values. Here we initially keep the constant g to keep the equation simply and later use it in the final answer as shown in equation 10. We consider mass 3 and mass 1 relation and we see that it is oriented that is not directly along the x or y axis of the Cartesian system. First we solve for the distance between the masses by using Pythagorean theorem as shown in equation 11. As we see that the length between mass 3 and 1 is given by equation 12. The x component and y component for this is given by its sine and cosine function. For the x component it is given by equation 14 and we rewrite this to get an expression for x component and we get equation 15. 
we see that the orientation of the x component would tell us that it is a negative value since it is pointed in the negative x axis so its unit vector is a negative i hat. The angle theta can be calculated using the ratio or we can just use the ratio in order to get a better approximation. So we see that the sine function is the ratio of the lengths r1 to 2 over r1 to 3 as shown in equation 16. We rewrite this to get an expression for the sine function as shown in equation 17. We then substitute this to our equation 15 and substitute also the known values we get an expression shown in equation 18. Simplifying it further, we get an equation for the x component as shown in equation 19. For the y component we use the cosine function as shown in equation 20. The equation shows that the cosine function is the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse length as shown here. Rewriting it we get an expression for the y component and it is given in equation 21. We see that it is a negative value and this is because it is pointed downwards in the negative y direction. So we see here it is a negative j hat value. We now have an expression for the cosine theta which is equation 22. We then substitute this to our equation and its known values as shown in equation 23. Further simplifying the equation we get an expression for the y component as shown in equation 24. We then sum the components as shown here for the x component using equation 5 for the net force. Where further manipulation shown in equation 25 we arrive at an expression for the x component of the net force as shown in equation 26. We then sum the forces along the y-axis using equation 6. Substituting the known values we get that the y component of the net force is given by equation 28. We then solve the magnitude of the net force using Pythagorean theorem shown in equation 29. Where we get equation 30. We continue to calculate the net force as shown in equation 30. We substitute and simplify the equation and we arrive at the value of its magnitude it is given in equation 31. If we compare this to the image, the net force can be viewed as an arrow going towards the smaller mass. The images show the net force orientation. The image on the right shows a net force that is directly oriented in the opposite direction as the net force vector on the left. They are both equal in magnitude but opposite in direction and this is due to the consequence of Newton's third law. We now calculate the angle of the net force using a tangent function as shown in equation 32. Using the tangent function where it is the ratio of the y component over the x component as shown in equation 32 we get that it is about 14.6 degrees or 0.25 radians. So, the magnitude and direction is given by equations 31 and 33. Graphically, the orientation of the net force can be presented by both images where the angle alpha is measured along the x-axis. The weight of a body is defined as the total gravitational force exerted on the body by all other bodies in the universe. This suggests that we are interacting with every particle in the universe but its effects are not felt easily due to the significantly large distances and huge difference in mass but nonetheless we have some interaction with objects in the universe that are very far away. If we model the Earth as a spherical symmetric body as shown in the image, with radius r of e and mass, the weight w of a small body of mass m at the Earth's surface is given by equation 33. If we use the equation for the weight that we have been using so far, we can write an expression for the gravitational acceleration of our planet which is shown in equation 34. 
we see that the acceleration g is dependent on the mass of the planet and its radius. This equation can be applied to other objects if we want to calculate its gravitational acceleration. Here we have an example. Example A 50 kg person is on top of MT. Everest at a height of 8848 m above the surface of the Earth. We are asked to find its weight at the surface of the Earth A and A its weight at the top of the mountain. For letter A, to find the weight of the person on the surface we use equation 33. We substitute the values and carefully consider the magnitudes of the given so that they can be utilized correctly. We get that the weight of the person on the surface of the Earth is about 489.67 newtons shown in equation 34. For letter B, we consider that the person is positioned at the top of the mountain. We again use equation 33 but the distance is modified to include the height of the mountain. After substituting and manipulating the equation we get that the weight of the person when it is on top is about 489.55 newtons. Comparing the two values we see that they are almost the same. This suggests that there is little difference in gravitational effects when the person is on the surface or on top of Everest. Gravitational Potential Energy we recall the expression for gravitational potential energy as shown in the equation 36. In this expression we consider the gravitational acceleration g to be constant. If the distance r changes then we need a more general expression for the gravitational potential energy. Consider radial force exerted by the earth on any mass on earth as given by equation 37. We see that it is pointed towards the earth. Note that the distance is measured from the surface of the Earth and we can express it as the difference of lengths as shown in equation 38. The work done in moving an object from point A to B is given by equation 39. Further expanding the equation we have the expression for the work shown in equation 40. So, the work done by gravity is only dependent on the initial and final position of the mass, hence it proves that the work done by gravity is conservative. Since the only force acting is the force of gravity then the work A is equal to the change in potential energy as shown in equation 41. The general expression for the gravitational potential energy is given by equation 42. Here we have another example. A 50 kg person is on top of MT. Everest at a height of 8,848 meters above the surface of the Earth. We are asked to find its potential energy at the surface of the earth and its potential energy at the top of the mountain. For letter A, to find the gravitational potential energy of the person on the surface we use equation 42. We substitute the values and carefully consider the magnitudes of the given so that they can be utilized correctly. We get that the potential energy is given in equation 43. For letter B, to find the gravitational potential energy of the person on top of the mountain we also use equation 42. We substitute the values and carefully consider the magnitudes of the given so that they can be utilized correctly. We get that the potential energy is given in equation 44. Comparing the results, we see that there is a minimal difference which again makes sense since the radius of the earth is comparably larger than the height of the mountain. The motion of satellites. Satellites move around the Earth without crashing on Earth. However, if the speed is too high it will escape the Earth and never return. If the speed is too slow, it will not escape the Earth but crashes back to Earth. The speed of the satellite must be just right in order to maintain its orbit. Let us derive the speed needed to maintain an object in orbit as shown in the figure. The speed we are referring to would be the tangential velocity. 
you aim may review your knowledge about circular motion in Module 7. As the object with mass m moves around the Earth, it is being pulled inward by the gravitational force and for it to maintain in its orbit an equal but opposing force called the centrifugal force. By Newton's second law we write the relationship as shown in equation 45. Considering the magnitudes only and substitute the expression for the gravitational force and the centrifugal force. We note that the centrifugal acceleration is equal but in the opposite direction as the centripetal or radial acceleration as shown in equation 46. So we arrive at the expression in equation 47 which we further simplify. Further simplifying equation 47 we see that the tangential velocity is a square root of the expression shown in equation 48. This is the formulation of the speed needed in order for an object to stay in orbit and we see it's dependent on the radius or the distance of the object and the mass of the planet that it orbits around. The time it takes to make a complete revolution is called the period t. We recall the expression for speed which is the ratio of the distance over the time. For this case, the distance would refer to the arc length which is equal to 2 times pi times the radius. The time here would be the period which we then rearrange the equation. After substituting the speed v or the tangential speed we get three versions in calculating the period t. Calculating the total mechanical energy of a moving object at a distance r. Recall the expression for the mechanical energy which is given by equation 51. After further manipulation of the equation we arrive at the expression for the total mechanical energy given by equation 52. It shows that the energy is negative and when the mass goes very far the energy becomes less negative. Here we have an example. A 1000 kg satellite is put into orbit at 300 km from the surface of the Earth. Letter A, what is the speed, period, and radial acceleration of the satellite? And letter B, how much work is done in putting the satellite into orbit? For letter A, to find the speed, period, and radial acceleration of the satellite we use the equations shown here. First we solve for the velocity or specifically the tangential velocity and we obtain the value shown in equation 53. So the satellite moves about 7000 meter per second. For the period we can use either of the two equations. First we have the one involving the gravitational constant and mass of Earth. After substituting the known values we see that the period would be around 5000 seconds or about 90.5 minutes for the satellite to move around its orbit. Using the other equation and the value of tangential velocity obtained earlier we have that the period is about 5000 seconds also with a slight difference in seconds but it is still around 90 minutes. So, either equation and values obtained are acceptable but personally I would prefer to use the equation that is obtained from the given values in case the calculated ones might be wrong. For the radial acceleration or also known as centripetal acceleration we use equation 46. After manipulating the equation and substituting the known values we obtain the radial acceleration which is given in equation 55. For letter B, we find the work is done in putting the satellite into orbit by using the equation for change in energy as shown here in equation 55. Considering the energy at the surface where the satellite is initially at rest before being launched to space shown in equation 56. The kinetic energy at the surface would equal to zero and only gravitational energy is present. So we can write that the mechanical energy at the surface of the Earth is given by equation 57 which is just the gravitational potential energy. For the satellite in orbit where it is moving at an elevated position, its mechanical energy is given by equation 58. Substituting the equations for this condition which we have equation 59. 
Further simplifying the equation we obtain an expression for the mechanical energy in orbit shown in equation 60. We then substitute the obtained expressions for the mechanical energies to equation 55. Further simplifying the expression we arrive at equation 60 which is the work done in putting a 1000 kg satellite to this orbit. Johannes Kepler was a German astronomer, mathematician, astrologer, natural philosopher, and writer on music. He has contributed significantly in the scientific revolution and is best known for his planetary motion. The motion of planets are described accurately by Kepler's laws of planetary motion. These empirical laws are mainly based on the data collected by Kepler's mentor Tycho Ubra. These laws provided the basis for Newton's discovery of the law of gravity. Kepler's three laws are stated here. First, each planet moves in an elliptical orbit, with the Sun at one focus of the ellipse. Second, a line from the Sun to a given planet sweeps out equal areas at equal times. And third, the periods of the planets are proportional to the powers of the major axis lengths of their orbits. Let us look closer at Kepler's first law which states that each planet moves in an elliptical orbit, with the Sun at one focus of the ellipse. A earlier belief people believed in the geocentric model which was the predominant belief at that time. It states that the Earth was the center of the solar system. The Sun, Moon, and other planets revolve around the Earth. The work of Kepler shows a much more accurate model for the behavior of the Earth where its orbit forms an elliptical shape as shown on the figure on the right. We examine the relationship of the distances and put the orbital system in a Cartesian system. There are two foci labeled as F1 and F2. The Sun's position is located at S which is equidistant with S'. prime. The longest length is called the major axis it is equal to 2A. Half of this longest length is called the semi-major axis equal to A. The shortest length is called the minor axis it is equal to 2B. Half of this shortest length is called the semi-minor axis equal to B. The distance from the origin to points S and S' prime is denoted as C. Consider the distances R1 and R2 which are measured from the S and S' prime. When point P is moved at a different position in the elliptical orbit, the sum of these distances remain constant as shown in equation 61. From the figure, we see that we can calculate the value of R by using Pythagorean theorem as shown in equation 62. The total distance of the R is given by the square root of the sum of the squares of B and C as shown in equation 63. Since the total distance is constant, then we can write an expression for that sum as twice the square root of the sum of the squares B and C shown in equation 64. Eccentricity is denoted by letter E, which is the ratio of the length C over the semi-major axis as shown in equation 65. For a circle the length C is equal to the zero since the focus will be at the center as shown in equation 66. When the length C is equal to A, the eccentricity is equal to 1 as shown in equation 67. This would result in an orbit which is very flat or a straight line as shown in the figure. Here we have different eccentricities. We see that for E equals to 0 appears a perfect circle. As it gets larger and larger in value of eccentricity, it will look more of an ellipse. For different eccentricities they have different names. For eccentricity equal to 1 it has a parabolic trajectory and for eccentricity greater than 1 it is called hyperbolic trajectory. Here we have a table for eccentricity for different planets. Earth has an eccentricity that is 0.0167 which results in an elliptical orbit we have now. The positions closest and farthest from the Sun are identified as the perihelion and aphelion, 
respectively. They are positioned along the major axis as shown in the figure. Kepler's second law is graphically shown here where two areas at the perihelion side and aphelion side are equal. The planet will cover here we see that at the perihelion, the arc length is large and at the aphelion side the arc length is small. It is expected that the planet at both sides will cover the same time which we will show in the following slides. As the planet moves, there is rate of change in this position which is given by the derivative theta. So, it produces an area which is approximately shaped like a triangle that we can use the equation for the area of a triangle shown in equation 68. We then replace the parameters by substituting the base equal to E times the change in theta. And the length or height H equal to the radius R as shown in equation 69. As the planet moves, there is change in area over time which is given in equation 70 and this equation is called the sector velocity. So, when the planet is close to the sun or at the perihelion, the distance r is small and the rate of change is large. When the planet is far from the sun or at the aphelion, the distance r is large and the rate of change is small. Now we examine the tangential velocity and we can express it in two ways. The first is using the sine function of the angle phi which is equal to the tangential velocity over v shown in equation 71 and simplified in equation 72. We can also express it by using the classical description of distance over time. The distance traveled will be the arc length which is just the radius times the rate of theta. The tangential velocity is shown in equation 73. We then equate the two expression for tangential velocity where we write an expression for the rate of change of theta shown in equation 73. Substituting equation 73 to the sector velocity we have an expression shown in equation 74. Now this is a familiar expression since we can apply the cross product expression for the radius and the velocity times sine function of phi as seen in equation 75. We then multiply it by m over m shown in equation 76 in order to get an expression for the angular momentum L shown in equation 77. So here we can talk about the rotation of the planet in terms of its angular momentum and what happens to its torque. Kepler's second law also tells us that the planet moves fastest when it is near the perihelion and slowest when it is near the aphelion. In order to keep the same rate of area or keep the sector velocity constant. Kepler's third law states that the periods of the planets are proportional to the powers of the major axis lengths of their orbits. So we have already derived the expression for the period and we simply replaced it with sun's mass and replaced the distance r with the semi-major axis a. So the period for an object orbiting around the sun is given by equation 78. So we see that the function is independent of the shape of the orbit which means it does not depend on the eccentricity. Here we have an example. A rocket is fired from Earth towards the Moon. For letter A, find the minimum speed needed to shoot a rocket straight up to a height above the Earth's surface equal to the Earth's radius. For letter B, find the minimum speed that would allow the rocket to escape from the Earth completely. This is also called escape velocity. Neglect air resistance, the Earth's rotation, and gravitational pull of the Moon. For letter A, we find the minimum speed needed to shoot a rocket straight up we look at the energies at the surface and at an elevation. At the surface the energies is shown here in equation 79. Here the rocket has both kinetic and potential energy since it is launched with an initial speed or minimal which we need to find out. So we have the expression shown in equation 80. Now, at the elevated position where the rocket perhaps runs out of fuel and stops moving, the energies are shown in equation 81. 
Here we see it has only the gravitational potential energy and we have equation 82. Since the distance is just equal to the Earth's radius then the distance r where it is measured from the Earth's center is equal to twice of the Earth's radius and we have the energy shown in equation 83. Equating the equations for the energies we have equation 84. Substituting the equations we obtained earlier we have equation 85. Further manipulating the equation we arrive to a simplified version shown in equation 86 where it is a function that will allow us to solve for the minimum velocity needed to launch the rocket. We then substitute the known values as shown in equation 87. We then arrive at a solution shown in equation 88 for the minimum speed the rocket should be launched and it is about 7000 meters per second. For letter B, we find the minimum speed that would allow the rocket to escape from the Earth completely. So, at the surface we still have equation 79 and 80. As the rocket is launched to escape Earth we set the distance to infinity. So the energies at infinity would be zero as shown in equation 90 and 91. Equating the initial and final energies we have equation 84, where it is further simplified from equation 92 and arrives at an expression in equation 93. After substituting the known values we have the speed of 11,000 as shown in equation 94. This is the minimum speed that would allow the rocket to escape from the earth completely and it is also called the escape velocity. Here we see that it is independent of the mass of the rocket but only depends on the mass of Earth and its radius. So if you know the planet's mass and its radius, then you can calculate the initial speed you need in order to escape its gravitational effects. Of course you have to include the rotational speed of the planet and its air resistance. That is it for now and I hope you learned something new today. For questions and comments you may send them to diyeslearningstuff at gmail.com. A you may review the slide on YouTube at diyes at diyeslearningstuff. Note, please do not forget to use your school email. Also write your complete name and a class section. Thank you for listening and see next module.